get underway. Our first talk is going to be given by uh, Shana Mochalingam, uh, and his talk is titled um, A Motor Adaptation Paradigm to Strengthen Implicit Learning. Thank you, Adam. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen there. Hopefully that's working well. So like Adam mentioned, my name is Shana and I'm from York University and in, in Canada. We had a little bit of confusion before the talk began about that. And I'm, I'll be talking about a motor adaptation paradigm to strengthen implicit learning. And again, in this um, talk, it's gonna be in the context of visual motor adaptation. So when we learn a movement, and that is what I mean by that is when we learn to reduce errors, we have generally two different processes that are happening at the same time. So one is an explicit process and another is an implicit process. Explicit processes, you can consider them as conscious strategies to your movements. So these are nice in that they can develop very quickly as in we can see a very obvious error and we can think in about a second what I'm going to do next to counter that error, but they're cognitively expensive and one of the biggest problems with that is that they take a lot longer of a preparation time before you can initiate the movement. Implicit processes are, on the other hand, are more slower to develop. So they take a few different exposures to an error before they become fully developed, but they're more efficient. However, they can be limited and invariant. And I'll talk about what I mean by limited and invariant in a little bit. One really, cool thing about implicit processes is that they do kind of free up cognition for other things. So for instance, if you've implicitly learned to adapt to a small error, say because of muscle fatigue or something, I can be having this conversation while reaching for something and countering that error. So again, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on implicit processes and again, in the context of visual motor adaptation. So what do I mean by limited and invariant? A few studies in the past have looked at the amount of implicit adaptation that can occur when adapting to, in this case, again, visual motor rotations of various sizes. So you can see here on the x-axis that we have a bunch of different perturbation sizes in various studies, ranging from 30 to 60 degrees in all studies. But you can see that when implicit adaptation is measured in the y-axis, they're all very similar. So whether people adapt to a 30 or a 60 degrees rotation, implicit adaptation seems to stay around this 10 to 20 degree mark. There is some differences between studies, but within one setup, they seem to be fairly, again, invariant. Regardless of the perturbation size, you have a similar amount of implicit adaptation. Now, like I mentioned, there are various benefits to implicit adaptation. And it would be nice if we can bring this implicit adaptation to a higher level. So has this been done? So we do have one previous study from our lab in the past. Again, it's an older study. So we didn't really measure implicit adaptation as well as we do now. It wasn't isolated as well, but we do see that in two different groups, so in this group, in these two groups, people adapted to a 30 and a 70 degree rotation, right? The 30 degree rotation people or groups are in the white here and the 70 degree rotation group is in the black here. But we can see that over three blocks, the 70 degree rotation group did have, again, this is implicit adaptation on the Y axis. They did show higher levels of implicit adaptation going all the way up to like 40 degrees. Now, two things. One, like I mentioned before, implicit adaptation wasn't well isolated. So we do want to see if this difference between the groups is because of actual implicit adaptation differences or because of our, our measurement error. Another thing is that we, um, when people adapted to the 70 degree rotation, people adapted in a stepwise manner. So in that, what we mean by that is for the first rotation block, people only adapted to a 30 degree rotation and then a 50 degree rotation and then a 70 degree rotation. So we wanted to see if it was this methodological difference that resulted in higher levels of hopefully implicit adaptation. So how do we measure this? So we had two different phases 
The first one is just an align phase where we, people reach to a target with that cursor aligned with their real hand position. And that's what we call this align cursor training. And interleaved, we had no cursor reaches, which means people again reach these targets, but they don't get visual representation of their hands. So they're basically blind reaches. And then people adapted to an, a rotation. So in this case, we went with a 60 degree rotation, which is a fairly large rotation. But again, within these training trials, we interleaved no cursor trials. But importantly, we were sure to ask people to either reach with a cognitive strategy. So again, when they're adapting, if they, if they had a cognitive strategy that they were using, we told them to either use that strategy or to not use that strategy during the reach. And the idea is that if they're not using a cognitive strategy, if they're trying to reach directly to the target, but they still deviate by some amount, we consider that implicit learning. Okay. So here's how our experiment setup looks like. So people reached on a digitizing tablet here and their hand was occluded by a mirror and visual display was also shown on that mirror. So we had we wanted to test this abrupt versus stepwise um, adaptation paradigm. So in the abrupt rotation, so this was one group, in the abrupt rotation, people experienced the entire 60 degree rotation on the very first trial. So they went from a zero degree rotation to a 60 degree rotation, this was very obvious. And this is what's usually done in visual motor adaptation paradigms. In the stepwise rotation, people in the first um, block of rotated training, they only experienced a 15 degree rotation. After they fully adapted to the 15 degree rotation, they experienced another 15 degree rotation, so 30 degrees in total, and so on until after four separate blocks, people experienced a 60 degree rotation, just like in the first group. So ideally we wanted to see more implicit learning in this group, in this stepwise rotation group, compared to the abrupt rotation group. So here's another um, explanation of our, our paradigm. So this is a perturbation schedule. So on the bottom here, we have trials and on the y-axis, we have what perturbation people experience. So again, they have an aligned phase and in this abrupt group, people experience a large 60 degree rotation on the very first trial. And the stepwise group looks something like this where they do 15 degrees at a time until they reach a full 60 degree rotated group. So in previous literature, there's been some conflicting evidence as, as to whether something called a gradual rotation leads to more implicit adaptation. So a gradual rotation in this case is something like this, where over, in this case, it's 60 trials, people eventually, again, reach, to, um, reach using a 60 degree rotation, but the rotation is introduced one degree at a time. Okay. So again, we wanted to see if that also led to higher implicit learning. And again, these, little orange markers are these places where we had these no cursor reaches. Okay. And I just want to point out that I marked these as block one, two, three, four, that becomes important later. So this is just how performance looked like. So what I just want to highlight here is that all three groups by the end of training, when they're during block four, when they're ad adapting to a full 60 degree rotation, they perform similarly. So all groups are able to adapt to a 60 degree rotation. So now let's look at the implicit learning. So again, these are these no cursor reaches when we tell people not to use any cognitive strategies. Surprisingly, we see that with both gradual and abrupt rotation paradigms, people don't go above this 15 degree-ish limit that I mentioned before. So again, in, in this case, in blocks one, two, three, and four, by the time we measure these implicit after effects, people have adapted to a full 60 degree rotation. But again, implicit learning is still at this 15 degree mark. However, when we look at this stepwise rotation, we clearly see that by the time people adapt, sorry, by the time people adapt to a full 60 degree rotation, they do show higher levels of implicit learning. 
So I think we've robustly shown that this stepwise rotation is different. Again, we're doing experiments to see why this might be different. Um, the whole pandemic has kind of slowed that down, but it, we can at least show that phenomenologically it is different than the other two experiments, right? So learning in this manner, for some reason, increases implicit learning. So what's up with this gradual learning? So again, I mentioned there is some difference in or conflicting evidences in previous studies regarding gradual learning. And what we see is that when we tell people to use a strategy, they're not able to use a strategy, especially in this very first block, when we first tell people or measure these after effects, when we tell people to use a strategy, they don't really have an explicit strategy developed at the beginning. It takes some time for people who have experienced a gradual rotation to come up with a cognitive strategy. So it, it, it's a little strange. It seems that implicit um, learning is not different between gradual and abrupt um, introduction of a perturbation. However, it's this cognitive strategy used that's actually a little bit different. So in conclusion, again, implicit learning is invariant within the gradual and abrupt groups. And gradually, sorry, I think I'm missing a word there. And gradually introducing a perturbation actually leads to a lowering in strategy use, right? Or it takes longer for people to come up with a cognitive strategy. However, introducing a perturbation in a stepwise manner like we predicted can lead to actual increases in implicit learning. So we do think it's, this is important because like I mentioned before, in when it comes to like a rehabilitation sense, it's important that people are able to use or adapt to things while not having to cognitively think about the things that they're adapting to. So with that said, I'd just like to thank our lab. So here's Marius and Raphael who will be giving a talk very shortly. And from there, I'll take any questions. All right, that was uh, that was a great presentation, and that effect looks uh, absolutely massive. So uh, that's really interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing about how you'll follow that up in the future. You've had a bunch of questions pop up, and we have had a person with their hand raised. Uh, so I'm going to first uh, allow Caro to unmute herself, um, and she can ask her question. Great, thank you so much. That was a that was a great talk. Um, so I've actually um, used the stepwise um, paradigm as well, and, and what you're showing resonates um, with what I see in my data. I'm awesome. curious if you've maybe um, looked at whether um, baseline variability predicts um, or correlates with um, uh, implicit um, adaptation, just because there's a paper showing that basically becoming aware of the, um, of the rotation um, is dependent on your um, base and variability, which then governs your detection uh, threshold. And also, sorry, um, just secondly, do you think therefore this effect would uh, depend on the tool you're using? Because maybe in joysticks, there was, there's more variability than in like a, um, a reach um, adaptation paradigm. Right, so there's a few questions in there and, and thanks for the question, we should definitely contact each other later after the talk, maybe since you are working on similar things. Okay. So firstly, about the baseline variability, um, we, I am aware of that paper. And the reason we chose 15 degrees is that in general, that's around the detection threshold. So we wanted it to be not not too similar to the gradual rotation paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, can, if you think about it, a gradual rotation is just a lot of one degree steps. Yeah. Right, so we wanted to make sure people were sort of at least at the beginning noticing that there was this rotation. So, but we didn't look at um, any relationships between individual baseline variability versus mm -hmm. um, how they learn. Now, we do have fairly large numbers in these group, groups. Um, they had 37 people in each group. Mm -hmm. So we'd assume that the baseline, I mean, again, I'd have to do a correlation to see if there's a, diff or there's a correlation there, but I'd assume that within these groups, like we have the whole gambit, right? Right, so yeah. Regardless, because they, sorry, I just wanted to mention, 
if it is, if baseline variability does influence this, it's not driving it. So we'd assume mm -hmm. that within these large groups, like one wouldn't have a higher baseline variability. Cause like I said, everyone did the exact same baseline test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be just interesting to look in further into that um, sure. into that uh, one group, just because my data doesn't allow me, I don't have enough um, uh, subjects to, to do that analysis, but I also chose a, a 10 degree stepwise increasing rotation because of that reason, because of its, uh, it's lower than the detection threshold. All right, okay. so 